welcome. This is a special two-hour event called Women to Inspire a Sustainable Japan. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm your host, JJ Walsh, and I'm in Hiroshima, and all these amazing women are all over Hiroshima in different areas. We have four great speakers today. We have Angela Ortiz, Ruth Jarman, Trista Bridges, and Noriko Shindo. Thanks so much. And my collaborators on this event, we were planning originally to have an in-person event today. Uh, now we're doing the online version. Tova Kinoka and Shirley Kochian. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining on this holiday. It's great to have you here. Let's start with some introductions. So we want to have short introductions from all the speakers and tell us about your current jobs and projects. Do you want to start first, Angela? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Ortiz. I grew up in Japan, in rural Japan. I'm originally from the U.S. Um, I've been working in sustainability, social impact, community development, um, for the last 10 years, maybe. Um, I mostly work in with volunteers, with volunteer training and a lot of education development for international schools and for Japanese rural communities to help rebuild their towns. I specifically focused on areas that were devastated in natural disasters and so have a real need for both infrastructure, but also for the community fabric to be reestablished. So based on this experience, I've written a book called Eight Principles on Social Impact Leadership in Japan. You can check that out on Amazon. I do have some experience working in corporate and helping different but same, where you're helping to raise the, the level of awareness of your employee body and integrate social impact programs across your different teams. So that has its own challenges, but also really, really fun and exciting to be part of the impact that big changes can be made both in the, the private sector and also the corporate sector. Um, you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with the ladies here about the various aspects of sustainability and what it means to be working in this field as a woman. Thank you, Joy. Back to you. Thanks so much, Angela. How do you say the name of your consultancy? Stratikist. Stratikist. Okay, it's I got a play it. on strategy and techniques. Wonderful. And you, of course, founded Place to Grow. Do you want to just mention Place to Grow as well? Sure. I've been so the, the social impact work has been under this uh, organization called Place to Grow. Uh, that has been alive for 10 years now, 11 years now. And we're actually just coming to a point where we're handing off leadership to the local team. And that organization will be evolving into another phase uh, where we no longer work as an organization. And so what I'm going to be doing, as long with a lot of my colleagues in this, uh, this organization, you can see we've run all these different community events, um, art, music, sport, uh, so many different things, barbecues. Um, and including economic enhancement is in the portfolio of Place to Grow. We've done a lot of work reestablishing farming initiatives that now run as sole businesses. So that's been very exciting to be a part of as well. And so moving forward, I'm going to be working in education consulting with international schools and corporations. And that is the, uh, the mission of Stratakist Consulting. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, great. Uh, Tova, did you have any comments or questions to follow up with? Well, I was really interested in, um, so you were talking, Andrew, about the work um, in Tohoku with Place to Grow and the fact that sort of you went in there, obviously, at the beginning when the place had been devastated by the earthquake and tsunami, but then you, you've built up um, the, the capacity of the locals there to take that on and run it yourself. So I think that's, uh, you know, as sustainability consultants, that's something we really want to do, right? You want to kind of get to the point where you're making yourself redundant, basically, because you're building the capacity of whoever you're working with to be able to take that on. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's one of the cornerstones. I would say that is a key component of any social impact project is what is the local leadership? Do they have the capacity already to take it on or is it something that needs growing? 
Um, and there's two quick examples I can give. One was the farming project, which was which was already started with a clear economic uh, sort of focus in mind. So we were already working with established farmers uh, with the farming industry. Um, so that was when I would say that took about five years. And then we literally like I no longer involved in any of the planting or harvesting, none of that hands on work, but was able to completely hand over operations, financial management, uh, you know, hiring local people right away. Yeah. And that was built into the, you know, the, the five year programming. The Santa Soul Train is another example of a project that started in 2011. We had no idea where it was going. All we knew was that on a year by year basis, we were bringing value by bringing the community together and mm -hmm. helping various business leaders, community leaders, and even just like mothers and grandmothers stand up. We were giving them a platform to be seen and to work together on. And then of course we were providing the finances. And about five years in, we started to see that through some of these local leaders, finances could be um, accessed through the local government programs. We started to see that they could manage different aspects of the organization and we didn't need to be there. So it was really, um, it didn't have this big strategy, clear strategy. It was really year by year, just talking with them. And then as you hear back from them, their feedback on what they enjoyed doing, what they think they can do next year. And key part of this is when they get excited about something and they go, oh yeah, let's do this. That means that, oh, we have the resources and capacity to take this on, to own this. Mm -hmm. So my job was really just listening to these pieces and then saying, okay, how about this plan for next year? And then before I knew it, 10 years have gone by. And so 2021, I go up there with a small team of volunteers. I used to be a hundred of us managing yeah. everything. There's like five or six of us. And all we're doing is like standing in one corner, talking to some of the children. You know, I, did, I didn't set up any tents. I didn't take down any tents. <laughs> I didn't organize anything. I didn't make a budget. Like it was incredible to see that their leadership had evolved so far, but it wasn't. Yeah this like clear, crisp strategy plan for 10 years, it was very organic. And it was very much just about having conversations and listening to where you, where you can see that potentially this is where their strengths are now. Yeah. That's great. yeah. And we'll hear more about uh, all of your insights from building community uh, in the second hour. Uh, let's continue with the introductions. Ruth, you want to go next? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Joy, for having me on. And it's really wonderful to be on the same platform with all these uh, fantastic uh, women who are doing such important things in Japan. Um, a little introduction of myself. I came to Japan in first time in 1996-97. No, 86-87. <laughs> and I studied in Nagoya at Nanzan University, just some Japanese, and went back to uh, Boston for school. Then I got hired into a company called Recruit. Um, so something that's, I guess, a little bit different about me is from day one coming to Japan, I've been very deeply embedded in the Japanese corporate environment. So um, my company at the moment is called Jarman International. And basically, uh, for the last 10 years, so we're turning 10 this year, uh, the last 10 years, we've sort of um, helped regions and uh, Japanese corporations so local regions in Japan, as well as Japanese corporations, connect with the international audience. So our tagline is um, bridging Japanese content with international curiosity. So over the time that I've been here, from my time at Recruit, after that I was um, an independent contractor doing translation and uh, interpreting. Then I joined a big real estate, Japanese real estate company, and did a, a new business with Ezoi Hiromasa, who's like this very famous, he, he's passed away, but um, really famous entrepreneur in Japan. Um, and then with my own company, Jarman, uh, we try to, I guess I would describe it as uh, inspire incremental change within the Japanese organization. So in order to connect with the international audience. So whether you're connecting with the international person as an end user customer whether you're connecting with them as a partner company, whether you're connecting with them as an employee, because as we all know, uh, Japan is con constantly globalizing. Um, we try to help with 
training, with um, sales strategy, with how to promote. Um, we run Facebook pages for, you know, Kochi Prefecture, uh, things like that. So we try to, um, how would you say, like oil the, uh, the gears of the Japanese corporate engine as well as the regions to help them globalize in a very smooth and um, acceptable way to the Japanese corporate environment, which is often a very difficult line to walk. Uh, recently, so from about four years ago, I've been sitting on the board of Kadokawa, which is a very large publishing company in Japan, as well as uh, Fujibo, which is a very interesting, they started as a textile company. They've been around for 200 years, and now they're involved in semiconductors. So. Um, I get to, as a, it's, um, I guess it's an outside director, so I get to sit on these boards and see how these Japanese companies on the front lines are really trying to change. Um, I also have uh, contracts with uh, Yonezawa City in uh, Yamagata, uh, Kochi Prefecture, and then several uh, companies like JR East and stuff. And so we're trying to figure out how to bring these companies, these regions closer to this new market, which is basically the international group. So to me, that in a very large way, that is a sustainable aspect of trying to make Japan's economy sustainable by including more of an international presence at every single point. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great. Uh, you didn't introduce your books. Uh, can you just give us an overview of the books that you've written? Yeah, so I've written, um, there you go. Wow, thank you. I've written one, two, three, four, five. Six. The far right ones are actually articles. That's where everything started. I wrote a series of articles for a magazine. Um, so I've written six books in Japanese. And these all focus on, as I said earlier, I've been kind of like the ninja inside the Japanese company for the whole 34 years I've been here. So, you know, things that I found within the Japanese construct that were actually extremely positive and very good and that could be offered to the world. So it's very easy to find all the, you know, the mistakes that are being made or things that could be improved. I think no matter which country you go to. So what I tried to do is um, focus on good things about Japan, good things about uh, Japanese corporations, good things about uh, being a woman in Japan. And one of my books is actually about the wonder, uh, the wonderful aspects of Japanese women in all different ways and what I've experienced. So, um, yeah, just focusing on the good things. And they're all written in Japanese for the Japanese audience, because I find that um, a lot of Japanese people, since it since it's such a closed country and it's, you know, an island nation, a lot of people here it's so like understood that they don't even realize that these are some good things about the country that they can be proud of. So uh, Japanese people read this, they feel more confident and then they feel more brave, right? So when you become more confident, you become more brave. And when you become more brave, you're more uh, proactive when it comes to change. And Japan is going through so much change right now. The thing we need for everybody to feel is courage, right? So that's what I'm trying to uh, instill. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Trista, you want to go next? There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I guess I could probably say that I'm the newbie on the, in the group. I've been in Japan, um, I guess now six and a half years. Um, and actually, I would should say that it's my fourth country that I've lived in my life and probably maybe 18th that I've worked in in some capacity um, throughout my career. Um, I actually uh, come to Japan with a background um, principally uh, in marketing strategy um, and that was kind of my training, what I did much throughout most of my career and also a bit in entrepreneurship and technology. Um, but when I came here, um, I was it was around the time of the launch, just after the launch of the SDGs, as everybody probably remembers, like many foreigners, when you come here first, you try to find your footing and your, I don't like to say your purpose because I think we can all do many different things in life. Um, but, you know, really what appeals to you, where can you kind of work and, 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 and value and also, you know, st you start your career. And actually, um, I happened upon this topic of sustainability, which I had always been interested in some capacity throughout my career in some way. Um, but what I felt, because I had worked uh, with a lot of very large uh, companies, either as a consultant, um, the likes of Coca-Cola and Cadbury Schweppes, 
um, or internally in internal roles with organizations like Thomson Reuters, General Mills earlier in my career, that sustainability wasn't a sufficiently strategic topic for companies. And so what I wanted to do was essentially change that. So I actually met by chance uh, my co-founder and co-author. Um, we wrote a book called Leading Sustainably, The Path to Sustainable Business and How the SDGs Changed Everything. Um, and that was actually the foundation of our work. That's the book. And that really was a way of kind of doing two things. First of all, understanding what's going on on this topic in Japan and globally. Um, and also to really do some thinking around, okay, how can organizations really incorporate this in what they do? And one of the things that actually was the most valuable was talking to all these people. We talked to about 100 people around the world, very large companies from H&M to uh, HSBC and Citibank to um, also very small companies, you know, companies that really were sustainable from the start. You know, I think a lot of times large organizations, they use this as an excuse. It's not profitable. We don't know if it's going to bring value, but there's just, you know, dozens of examples of great companies who are doing wonderful things that are very, very sustainable around the world. And so we started uh, this uh, advisory service called Read the Air, that was essentially what you're seeing now, uh, which is our um, effort to really help companies uh, make this transition and change. I should say when I started this in 2018, the demand was, you know, companies were very much, particularly in Japan, were like, oh, what, we don't understand this. We, we don't know if there's value in this. The thing that's, I think, really fascinating about Japan is that when you look at sustainability, it really takes a stakeholder-oriented approach. And Japan is a stakeholder-oriented society in many ways, but it kind of lost its way. <laughs> so if you go back 100 years, 150 years, a lot of the ways we're thinking about companies now those were the type of companies they had in Japan. You know, you wouldn't do something in a village without asking the community what they thought. But after the war, things changed because the objective was different. The objective was to really create this kind of strong capitalist uh, focused, uh, uh, corporation driven society, right? That could kind of patch the country back together, help it rebuild itself and also help kind of, you know, the modern Japanese family, that's the way we think about it, um, have structure, right? And kind of be a part of its life. But what's happening over time, we're finding in Japan, but also elsewhere, is that that type of corporate structure is really fraying at the seams. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, challenges, right? So sustainability actually offers an opportunity for Japan, I think, to reclaim a little bit of its, um, I don't want to say its purpose, but, you know, it's kind of, in French we say, I'm also, I forgot to mention, I have French nationality too, raison d'être, its reason for being, you know, which is, it has a model that can actually be very valuable for how companies kind of think about and transform themselves around the world to more of this stakeholder model and reclaim some of that. Um, it also offers, you know, sustainability is a lot of, comprises a lot of challenges and problems. So what we often advise companies is there's opportunity in sustainability. You know, entrepreneurs are doing incredible things, tackling climate change, tackling food insecurity, tackling social problems and challenges we deal with. There's so many things to do, so much work to do. There's space for everyone. Um, so what we try to do is help companies think about this from an opportunities perspective, to think about what do we need to put in place to be able to have more sustainable business models uh, within our organizations. Um, and we work with companies of all sizes. So we pitch, we're pitching large, very large companies now. We're working with a new, very, very small client that is very sustainable, but is working around putting structure around that. What does that mean? Um, so that's fantastic. I love doing that. And then in addition, I also am um, an ESG advisor um, for a recently launched um, venture capital fund, which people may know called Empower. It was launched by uh, three very formidable and incredible women, uh, Kathy Matsui, Yumiko Murakami, and uh, Miyaseki. And they're really trying to, one, instill ESG in uh, particularly the private equity market and private markets here and venture capital here, uh, but also really kind of jumpstart, help jumpstart Japan's um, uh, startup ecosystem, which is growing, but it's definitely behind what you see in other countries. But that's starting to change. And they really want to be at the forefront of that. And my job is really to kind of advise them on how they can integrate ESG into what they do and also kind of help their portfolio companies to do the same. So that's me. <laughs> that was a lot. Sorry. For no, 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 that was great. Uh, Tova, did you have anything to add? <laughs> that is a lot, isn't it? And I know, I mean, I know Trista fairly well, and I know that she's doing so much incredible work out there. And I could see Ruth, you were nodding like crazy when she was talking about, um, particularly, I think that the, 
rediscovering, maybe reactivating mm. things that are sort of there, but are long buried have perhaps been forgotten. And I think that's sort of a common theme perhaps in the work of um, quite a few of us here today. So it'd be really interesting to, to dig more into that later on. Yes, happy to do so. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's great. Uh, last but not least, Noriko, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me today, um, Joy. Uh, my name is Noriko. I'm ethnically or biologically Japanese, um, but I grew up in mostly in London for the first half, first third of my life, I guess, first half of my life. Um, I came back to Japan and um, started my career in a very traditional banking <laughs> um, and then went on to getting an MBA in INSEAD came back to Japan and joined Amazon uh, in 2018. Um, but at the same time, uh, during my MBA, I actually myself turned um, vegan. And that kind of sparked a whole journey of being interested in uh, where my food comes from and sort of not just my food, but where does everything I buy come from? Um, and that quickly spurred into um, trying to live more uh, responsibly or sustainably or ethically, whatever the word is um, you want to choose. Um, and so as I came back um, to Japan and started working in Amazon, I also launched a free vegan website um, called Vigino that I was doing on the side to um, show people that it's actually not that hard to stay vegan in Japan. Back then it was like veganism was not a word that was recognized on the Nikkei newspaper like it is now. Um, and so it was kind of, I was having a tough time explaining myself in and of itself, but then realizing that Japan uh, historically actually we're pretty much vegan, um, except maybe the occasional fish or the, the uh, eggs when your um, chicken, if you have any, lays one, right? Um, so that was kind of what I realized as I went through my journey. And so you didn't have to rely on fancy imported vegan ready-made goods or go to a restaurant. Anything you buy in a supermarket could potentially be turned into an easy vegan meal at home. And that's kind of um, what triggered my journey initially. And then I've been with Amazon until very recently. So I act officially quit uh, last, was it October? Um, but simultaneously, um, I started Echo Local with my co-founder, Elen, back in 2020, uh, December. So we, that's uh, our starting point as a company. We started the project a little earlier in that year. Um, and again, the trigger was um, she had invited me to talk on her podcast about um, green change makers in Japan. And she wanted me to talk about Vigino. Um, and then, you know, sort of the before and after talking about the podcast and, you know, you have these meetings, we got on really well. And so she's like, can we just do this thing together? And the thing together, the thing that um, she had in mind, it's sort of what we now call our Echo Map. And it's our project, one of our projects at Echo Local. But she really wanted to um, just make visual on a map all the places that um, anybody in Japan would have access to to be able to easily make uh, zero waste shopping, so waste free or package free. Um, because she, through her own journey of trying to become sustainable, realized that, hey, there's a lot of places in Japan that are not like fancy organic shops or, you know, bulk store labeled, um, but enable you to take your container and fill it up with miso or with soy sauce or with rice. There's actually a lot of vegetable stores called yaoya that um, not everything is unpackaged, but many things are unpackaged. Uh, maybe they're not organic, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and so we sort of started this mission to just map out um, all these little stores uh, around Japan that um, are just like that by default. And and many of these places, they, they don't, I wouldn't say they don't care about sustainability, but that's not their primary focus. And so um, <laughs> our map is a little slow to load. This is our prototype, but um, these these stores don't necessarily care about being online or saying, hey, you can bring your container because these are family run uh, rice stores, vegetable stores, tofu stores that have been around for, you know, a couple of decades, some even like two two centuries, a noodle store. And, and all their focus is, is to cater to their local um customers and and it just so happens that um in japan i think many of you um touched on this in your self intros as well but not only did we kind of start in a close to vegan diet but in, in terms of lifestyle um you could ask my grandma or anybody in that generation and they'll tell you that to, until two to three decades ago it was actually quite normal to go to a tofu store with your pot pan 
we didn't have Tupperware, I guess, but whatever container to buy your tofu, or you just go back with a glass bottle, any glass bottle, and they'll fill it up with soy sauce. Like that was the Japan of up to two, three decades ago. And then suddenly this influx of um, convenient, cheap, uh, you know, plastic sort of took over the market. And now we're sadly famous for being, um, we have an overwhelming amount of plastic compared to other countries, especially if you look at some of our vegetables. It's like mushrooms are always double or triple wrapped and, you know, strawberries are each of them have that little white sponge and then that's double wrapped. So, um, you know, how did we get here? You know, that's we can go on talking about that forever. But our mission is really just to um, try to not go back to it, but kind of um, our first step is to show, um, you know, people that want to do this lifestyle easily um, and, you know, easier for their wallets, let's say, um, to just say, hey, you know what, you can just walk around and you'll find a lot of these stores. So our mission is to um, empower individuals to make better choices for themselves, their local community um, and the planet. And we feel like, you know, if you start making better choices in your local area, because you can, um, that ultimately actually happens to be uh, better for the environment as well um, in all sorts of different areas, like whether it's plastic or, you know, um, climate or whatever have you, organic, um, so chemicals. So that's kind of where we're at now. And then we do have a second project, um, which we launched in mid-February, which is an actual base, a physical base in Tokyo. Um, it does happen to look like a cafe and it is a cafe for now. Um, but actually our vision is um, to run it as a cafe, but also to run workshops in it to enable people to come in and borrow the kitchen and, you know, test out their um, plant-based businesses or bakes. Um, we do already do a few collaborations um, and then have sort of like weekend brunches or farmers markets there as well. So we launched that very recently. We're still kind of in the midst of trying to get operations um, quite stable, but I think we're at quite exciting times um, in, in our sort of stage of, I'd say, I don't know, startup. Um, so yeah, very happy to talk about this today and um, with all these amazing women. That's great. And I, I want to hear more about the events that you did, the Echo Shop Along. Uh, which was an interesting way to include some of your ideas and give people a chance to try it out, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, actually that's probably one of the most important. So um, we have been holding uh, monthly events um, of all sorts, but one of them which has become sort of our flagship event is the monthly Echo Shop Along. Um, and it sort of started with, hey, just come and tag along with Team Echo Local to do your shopping in these in this area with, you know, tofu, uh, rice and whatnot um, but that quickly evolved into this mini half day tour we take you around five to seven stores in a specific area that um, you can typically walk from edge to edge in what 10-15 minutes um, some areas like we've been to Chukagai or uh, Yanaka um, we, we have one in Otsuka near our cafe planned as well um, Ueno so we sort of um, try to diversify where in Tokyo they're often quite um, small shitamachi or local areas and um, we prep the participants ahead of time to warn them to bring their containers, echo bags, etc. to encourage them to um, shop pretty much waste-free on the day and then we sort of finish with either um, a, a lunch or a coffee which is totally optional um, in a well-ventilated area uh, you know so that um, people can sort of connect with each other because we often found, um, actually, we did a survey at the beginning of our project and found that aside from the top three barriers to living more friendly or eco-friendly, um, which are unsurprisingly, it's inconvenient, it's expensive, uh, don't know what to do. Um, one of the issues that we found, um, not top three, but kind of it stuck out to us is that it's sort of lonely. Um, and, you know, it, it was actually the same for myself. For example, if you suddenly come back from abroad and you're vegan and everybody in your family is like, oh, my God, what happened? What do we do for you? What do we cook for you? And then, you know, you see your friends and they're like, where do we go? What are you going to do? Um, that that in itself gives you a sense of like just being ousted from your social community. But, um, you know, and that's just uh, veganism. But I'm sure it's the same for if you're trying to reduce waste and, you know, you go to um, your office and your coworker comes back with omiyage and they're all packed and it's pretty and your valentine's you have white day you know japan has all these interesting um cultural things which which i love but you know also comes with its 
packagings. <laughs> so um, because of that, one of the things that I feel like our um, shop along does really well on top of the other events is to bring together um, some of these people who are who want to live like this or who already are living like this and come kind of together with a sense of, uh, you know, community and, and talk about, you know, they don't actually necessarily always talk about like echo living and or vent about, you know, these things. It's just like, you know, talk to people who are like minded. And I think that's worked really well. That's great. Thanks so much, Noriko. Uh, Shirley, did you have a comment or follow up? Yes, I do. And yeah, thank you, Noriko, for joining us. And yeah, I'm, I I can see that you have like a really diverse background, like not just from living in London, but also like joining in, working in uh, banks, and then moving to Amazon and being like a product manager. And yeah, I think I have a quick question for you. Uh, like your experience in corporate world, being a product manager and then moving to um, being an entrepreneur now. I'm wondering if you use your experience as a program manager, has it really like helped you or has it been just two different things? Yeah, it's funny because there are days when I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then there are days when I'm like, oh my God, it's all coming together. Like nothing that you do in your life is is a waste or a, a detour. And one example is um, on top of product management, uh, just before I was actually doing internal strategic consulting for Amazon. Um, and so kind of putting that together, what's really helped um, for me leading Echo Local is, you know, putting together strategy. Learned that a bit in MBA, but that's really I don't know if you've been to MBA, but it's kind of a mix of socializing and learning. Um, not that the learning then you can suddenly apply. So um, my days being a strategic consultant really helped in, in sort of thinking about strategy, going from just the brainstorming phase to, OK, what what is the plan? Um, and then product management really helped in the sense that from our early days, we've had a product roadmap of our map. And so right now it's still on prototype version. But, you know, in the background, uh, at least the two co-founders know exactly what we want, what it want, what it needs to look like and we're at this phase of just trying to find engineers to actually then start building the base um, for us but I think that really helped because every time we talk to a, a potential team um, in the name of you know engineer or um, talk to a company that um, we would be thinking about outsourcing to we know exactly what we want so like it's we're, we're not really wasting a, a meeting um, everything is quite efficient and so I found that there's not much that uh, everything in your experience I think um, counts. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much. Uh, Ruth, you had a, a shout out, a woman to watch that you wanted to talk about in your big idea. Uh, do you want to introduce that? Reinvention Japan Sense Matters? Yeah. Um, do you want to share the screen or wait, I maybe I can't, I don't know. I'll, I'll share the screen. I oh, that's it. Um, the book that I found recently, and somebody actually just recommended another one called Bushido Capitalism, which also just recently came out, which is highly recommended. Um, the thing that I wanted to share is that I feel like a lot of us, especially if you've been here a long time, you know, Trista, even six years might be kind of long <laughs> for some people, but um, if you've been here a long time, you tend to operate on assumptions you have of Japan, at least when I first came. So I was here at the end of the bubble period and then gone through the deflation side of Japan. And I tend to find myself deciding things about Japanese companies um, that are based on past experience. But what I've noticed is Japan at the moment is going through so much change. And um, what Trista said that really resonated with me was the strategy of sustainability and how this is a strategic mood, a, a, a strategic move. And um, your stakeholders in your company now expect sustainability. So it's a it's it's like not just strategy anymore, it's more survival. So for Japanese companies, for anyone, all of us as individuals, for us to survive, we need to think about the sustainability. So I've noticed a for maybe the last five or six years, there's this incredible change in the mindset of at least the top echelons of Japanese companies. 
And this book that Joy just shared, um, The Reinvention of Japanese Business, The Business Reinvention, what was it called again? The Business Reinvention of Japan, How to Make Sense of the New Japan and Why It Matters by a professor at UC, I think it was San Diego, Ulrich, how do you say it? How do you say it? Ulrika. <laughs> yeah, Ulrika. Anyway, so she actually, speaking of Kathy Matsui, one of the people that she interviewed for this book is Kathy Matsui's husband, Jesper Cole, who's a top economist about Japan. So she's an expert on Japan. She's interviewed a whole bunch of people. It was just uh, published in 2020. And literally, even though I am working in Japanese companies and working what I consider sort of on the front line of this change, when I read that book, I could feel the scales falling from my eyes. And it's all data-based. And it's all about um, how Japanese companies are going after an aggregate niche strategy. So if one company in Japan ends up not producing the one bolt that they make, the entire world's automobile supply chain can stop. You know, So this aggregate niche strategy. And in order to maintain their worth on the international stage, all of these companies are really trying to get involved with sustainability, SDGs, ESGs, as you all know. But she's got it all presented in clear data. She's a professor, so it reads like a textbook in an interesting way. So I would definitely recommend this book. And I think that she she's become one of my new heroes, you know, that she did such a great job uh, giving us a new picture of the current Japan. And um, yeah, it, it, I think it's a it's a good book to reference. One last thing is that I really believe more, at least sitting on the two boards that I'm on, um, there's a lot of international investors showing interest in Japanese companies, as maybe you all know. And I think that a lot of the international investors will be referencing this book. So it's nice to be on the same page as those international investors and how Japan is seen from overseas. So I can't recommend this book more. It was absolutely great. Anybody want to comment before we move to the next Women to Watch or recommendations? Oh, one thing I would say is um, I haven't read her book yet, but it's definitely on my list. But she has talks regularly, I think, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I think it's uh, she's a great resource for information. I, I think thinking about Japan from a um, strategic, business, geopolitical perspective, I think all of those things are, you know, they may seem a bit up here, but they really affect all of us every day. Yeah. And all the work we do. So I, I would definitely encourage people to, to, to listen to those as well. And I also thought that, um, Trista, you're um, advising the Empower uh, Venture Capital Fund, right? Yeah. So I, I help think, them with ESG and ESG strategy and integration. I think uh, Noriko might be a good candidate for some venture capital for her math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should I should say also my my husband and I and that's actually I have to connect to Noriko to him. He actually is a venture fund here as well, and he's really trying to actively invest in female entrepreneurs. So Good. we can talk about some of that a little bit later. That's another area of momentum which is great. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that in the the second hour about how women can can be successful in getting financial support. I think that's something a lot of people expect is all of our work is for free, right, Angela? You get that a lot? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to Angela, your uh, shout out, Mana Saza. Can you introduce that? Sure, sure. I actually, I, st I just stumbled upon her, her website and her work recently. Uh, what was really inspiring about seeing her online and knowing that she exists in the world, uh, it's just, you know, she's young, she's globally minded, but really rooted in Japan and, you know, had the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial sort of heart and, and um, resilience to start up her organization, Switch, which is, it's really a, one of their pillars is education and not just building awareness in the communities that are sort of already bought into the idea, but in the youth of Japan. Um, and using design and technology, which are languages that the young people really understand. And so I just was really inspired by her work and I, I wanna see more, uh, more manas out there doing their thing. 
Um, and so I wanted to share her because I think she's a great person. Uh, she could, you know, uh, be a guest speaker. She could be joining us here on a panel like this. Um, we can introduce her to like a lot of my clients are looking for people with a, an inspiring voice to, to educate their, their parents, their students, their employees. And so I wanted to bring her to light and shine the spotlight on her today. Oh, looks fam fabulous. Mm. Awesome resource. And uh, definitely, I would love to have these panels again and again with different inspiring women from around Japan. I think you guys have so much that you can share and support with each other. Uh, we don't have these kind of uh, events enough, right? <laughs> Uh, anyone else want to comment before we move to the next one? All right. Noriko, you had a recommendation for Asuka Hamakawa of Earth Company. Yeah. Um, so I happened to um, be listening on in a session. So I was taking this um, whole sort of set of courses for um, a program called sustainability consultant it's all in japanese and um, by the ethical association of japan and one of the sessions was um she was the guest speaker or she was the lecturer um and she was just she was like then and there my role model um i'm just gonna follow i don't know her personally but um based in bali i think with her husband um they co-founded the earth company they have about four sort of key projects and um, you know, three of them are sort of around impact. So they think they find impact heroes and they go sponsor them. And then they, they themselves do fundraising to then actually find the funds to sponsor these impact heroes. It doesn't necessarily have to be about climate change. It could be about um, social problems. And they go find these heroes, um, not necessarily from Japan, but just um, from where they believe is, you know, most impactful to put these funds. Um, they have other projects. Uh, they also do consulting themselves. And then um, they have a sort of fully circular, uh, zero waste, uh, really nice looking hotel resort in Bali called the Mana, Mana Paradise, I think. Um, and basically like, you know, everything including the walls, the bed, like everything is upcycled or something. Like there's a story to every single thing you touch, see, feel in the hotel. But when you look at it, it just looks beautiful like you don't get that it's this one now, you don't get that it's you know a project for sustainability or whatnot I think if you were to go there as a guest and I'd love to one day um you're just gonna have a great time so um I think she's inspirational also in the fact that um I love that she has two or three kids I think at the time of the lecture she was like, oh yeah I gave birth like two weeks ago and I'm like I love this um just this like it's refreshing so I myself um have one kid I'm actually pregnant with the second and I often get a lot of comments especially in Japan uh, and especially if you're a woman like oh but you, but you have a startup and you just recently started like how's the timing and I'm like does it matter does it you know why does it concern you and I don't really want to be rude so I'm just smiling and being like yeah none of your business but you know seeing a woman like this who's basically like I said just the perfect role model for me it's like you're doing it all you have your husband running the business with him you're in Bali and you have a hotel and you have this and you, you know and you know even just looking at her um background she I think she started a career in Boston Consulting Group um, so serious consulting career and then she studied I think in Hawaii for sustainability um, and then started this project slash company a, a couple of years ago so in many ways I just like one day I was like I found my role model um, and so I'm kind of secretly following her <laughs> that's great but I, I think that whole aspect of finding a balance with work, family, life, uh, free time, kids, right, is definitely such an important part of being a successful woman uh, in sustainability or working woman in general in Japan. You need that support network around you, right? Hopefully we can dive into more of that uh, in the second hour. Thanks, Noriko. Uh, Trista, did you want to shout out to Yukiko Iyo? Yes. So, um, so I actually had two women. The first one, uh, Yukiko Iyo. Actually, I did a um, a panel a couple of weeks ago for International Women's Day um, about women and innovation at CIC, which Innovation Center here in Tokyo. And her company is really interesting because uh, she's doing cat tech, so for pets, for cats. And basically it's a collar that we put on the cat and we use this to kind of judge or kind of understand how the cat eats, 
um, the food that it has, its health. Um, and I, I think the thing that's interesting about this is that we, you know, many people here probably don't pet, pet cats. I had a cat actually, and my cat actually died many years ago of liver cancer. And one thing that we know is that pet, pets are actually really expensive. <laughs> they're really, you know, we have very strong emotional bonds with them, but they're also really expensive. And to basically, to, to manage um, all of that, it, it, it could be actually quite onerous. And so this industry of, of pet wellness, cat wellness, et cetera, et cetera, is a massive industry. Um, and Japan is one of the leading countries for pet insurance, for example, um, globally. So I think the thing that's interesting about entrepreneurship is that we, we have to find uh, ways to solve problems. And sometimes those problems manifest themselves in ways we don't expect, right? We say, well, that sounds like a crazy idea, but actually entrepreneurs um, do attack things and address things that sound like crazy ideas. And this is a great business. And she actually has a lot of people on her team now. The company is growing really well. She wants to go international. She's very ambitious. Um, we had her at, uh, speaking at the event she is not extremely comfortable in English, but she did it anyway. She sat on that stage and she spoke in English anyway. And I think that's to be commended. Um, I could not do the same in Japanese, I must say. I'd be horrible. <laughs> but I was really excited for her. Um, so that's a great thing. And then another um, entrepreneur as well that I just want to talk about quickly. Her name is Soundus, and she has a company called, um, make sure I don't mess up the name, um, it's called, yes, Medico Limited. I wanted to just mention this one uh, because what she's doing is she's using AI to help Japanese companies, uh, particularly those in the, in the health space and also use help hospitals and those types of companies deal with medical records. And actually, I don't know if many people know, but lack of compliance around medical records is extremely costly for the health system, extremely costly for companies and other organizations. So she's trying to use uh, AI to help these companies uh, basically manage those risks. And that's something also that, that's a part of sustainability as well, which is health and wellness, managing health and wellness in a country such as Japan, where, where we're going to have more and more medical data because we do have an aging population. This type of technology is extremely um, important and helpful. So that's, that's it. Yeah, it looks looks really interesting and very important. I agree. And this ties into something I hope we'll have a chance to talk about later as well. Uh, Trista, you brought up in your article with Tokyo Weekender recently about the shrinking population in Japan and the need to depend more on foreign imports of labor as well. And I know, Ruth, you have some ideas about this as well, how Japan's corporate culture and society is definitely going to change in the next 10 years. <laughs> All right. Great stuff. Really exciting and interesting so far. Tova, Shirley, anything to add or comment before we move to the next part? Um, I was just uh, listening to Noriko talking about her, her role model that she recently discovered was um, just laughing actually because it really resonated with me. I mean, I started my company as my was having my second child. So it was an interesting uh, experience, um, challenging in many ways. It wasn't planned that way. Um, but I think it's so important to have role models because like you said, Noriko, you know, Perhaps there are sort of people find that surprising and look at you, but, but how could you do this and why would you want to, you know, work and uh, well, start a business and have kids at the same time? But, you know, we, we can't just put things on hold indefinitely. So I think having role models of people doing this where we can look and say, oh, OK, it's not easy, but it is possible is so important. And with any of the things we're talking about here, like whether it's women on boards or, you know, women uh, creating startups and things, just having those role models is so, so important. So I think that's another great reason to have, you know, events like we're doing today and the, the one we're planning to do in May. And so we can actually, you know, uh, show people I think that are considering it um, or have these ideas, but don't know how to take them forward, that there are, ways to do it. There are people out there doing stuff. And so, um, yeah, really encouraging to hear that. Can I just add something? Go ahead. Um, yep. So we, so there's two ways to make change, right? One is on this side, the entrepreneurial side where, you know, you're doing uh, a lot of interesting things while having kids, work-life balance, like the lady in Bali, right? 
And then the other side is in the corporate environment, in like the top echelons of the corporate environment, how is change happening there? And I have a funny story about a lady who just got hired into probably one of Japan's largest companies. And she is on the board at the top in charge of many different, she's basically the Joel Matorish Mariaku, which would be like the manage, one of the managing directors of this huge listed Japanese company, right? She walks in, she's the only woman, woman in the whole room, first of all, which, you know, we're kind of used to actually. And um, then she gets invited to the Japanese executive golf tournament, okay? So she's going out there to play golf on their course that they own somewhere, you know, outside of Tokyo. They all get picked up in limousines and stuff to go to the golf. I mean, we're talking serious, you know, top level Japanese company. So she gets in her car, driven to the golf course, gets there. Obviously, she's the only one because it's only the top executives of the company that are playing golf. She's the only female. Her husband is actually from Chicago. She's Japanese. Her husband's from Chicago. They have one son and they just moved to Japan about three years ago. So he is actually a stay at home dad. So he stays at home, takes care of their son. And she's out there just, you know, basically, you know, rocking the corporate world, right? She has a PhD in like digital analytics or something like that from the US Japanese lady. Okay, so she gets there into this very, very typical Japanese corporate golf situation. She'd been practicing for like the last two weeks so she could keep up. She's in the same group as the actual president. So what has happened is this lady from the outside is now the boss of all these other men who've been in that company for over 30 years, right? Because they worked their way up to the directorship. And now she has been brought in from the outside. So they go out and play golf and it's during lunch. This is just a, it's, it's just an excellent story for how things, there's role models for us who are really fighting for us in different areas of Japan. So they're eating their lunch. You know, it, in Japan, it would be normal for her to be pouring the beer for the boss, but she doesn't do it because she doesn't want to play that role because she's everybody else's boss in that room, right? So they come and no one knows how to handle her at all. So they come over and they ask the question that Noriko-san, I'm sure you've been asked a lot. Somebody comes over in a very polite way. They ask, you know, so um, who's watching your, I, I heard that you have a son. So who's watching your son today? And she's like, yeah, my husband's watching my son today. And they're like, your husband? And they said, does your husband do like, washing and things you know because they have no point of reference for anyone like her ever in their history and she says you know to be honest i don't even know the price of an egg at a japanese supermarket my husband does everything and she said she could literally see the scales falling from their eyes <laughs> they were all like what you know so there's shock therapy going on in one area of Japan. And then all of the rest of us are doing the, you know, on the front lines kind of change. So if this can all sort of come together and we have a whole big change, it'd be very interesting. But I just wanted to do a shout out to her. Her name's um, Noriko. That's the, the only full, I can't give the full name, but her name's Noriko and she's out there fighting the good fight for all of us in corporate Japan. So I just wanted to put that out there. Somehow That's I'm great. happy that her name is Noriko. <laughs> Noriko's same name. That's wonderful. And it, it reminds me of this quote from another woman who has broken some serious uh, ceilings for all of us, Kamala Harris. She says, what I want young women and girls to know is you are powerful and your voice matters. I love that quote. Um, I think her husband also is getting a lot of the same questions there. I think, can I, can I just say quickly, one of the things that I do hope will change is that maybe we can all go back to a world where when we have children, lots of people participate in their development, right? I think it's really strange <laughs> that we've gotten to this place where the mother has to do everything. I yeah. don't even think that's really healthy for the child, it, him or herself. You know, I, my son, he's 11 and lots of people throughout his life has had to have had a participation in his development because I had to work and yeah, you know, exactly. I've had wonderful caregivers. I've had people who just stepped in and helped me along the way. My husband 
who's, you know, when he's, he's not working too, he, you know, I, I actually insist that he do certain things and he would, our biggest challenge is more like if he asks, he'll, if I ask, he'll do it, but spontaneously he may not think to do it. So we're working on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that that will be also another change that we'll see in coming years. And also for single parents, how do we rally support around single parents as well? Um, I was part of the Japan Travel Awards the other day and the top Grand Prix prize went to the Fukushima Barrier Free Tourism Center. And I was so happy to see that they won because having more accessible facilities helps mothers and parents and people with strollers, uh, people who get injured, it helps everybody. So there's, there's so many support networks around uh, caregivers that we can definitely improve on, right? Just to add to All that, right, the, sorry, yeah, just one ahead. last thing. We went to Disneyland the other week and we're actually outraged that, so in our house, the husband does the diapers, like I've only ever changed it five times. And even this is true when we're together and outside. So in Disneyland, he goes find a toilet and he comes back and says, it's incredible. There's no facility in the men's. So he has to go to the the large, you know, the one for wheelchair disabled, what the everything toilet. And of course, there's a lot of people in Disneyland. So he has to wait a while. I go into the women's to do my thing. And I'm like, heck, there's a <laughs> there's space for women to change nappies in the women's. And that happened to every single bathroom. But, you know, and we were like, this is Disneyland. I mean, I know that it's run by a Japanese company, but we were quite surprised in the negative. Yeah. Yeah. And having, having more access for both parents to do everything uh, would help everybody. It's the same thing about uh, women at work and not just having rules which help women, but having rules that help everybody uh, to have more work-life balance, right? Yeah. All right, uh, let's go into the second hour. So in this part, we're going to be talking about a little bit more detail, uh, each speaker talking about your wheelhouse, uh, your skill set from things that you have learned through your career um, that you can tell us a little bit more in depth about. Uh, Angela, would you like to start? Sure. That is like the most big request. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. I'm just like, yeah. Um, so so you, you gave us an introduction. Yeah. yeah about yeah. Um, the project I'm trying to say that you started to so, start from yeah. this. Um, I guess I can explain a little bit. Let's focus a little bit on my experience in community building because that's sort of the common thread. Um, I guess maybe a lot of people don't know. I actually didn't study this I grew, came into the adult world um, with a certification as a kindergarten teacher. And that was because I had my daughter when I was 20 and I needed a way to figure out how to support her but not be leaving her in daycare for you know, 10, 15 hours a day. And that worked out really well for me. Um, but in 2011, I responded as a volunteer to the tsunami in North Japan and suddenly was like responsible for distribution of food and water supplies. And I learned a lot about how to attack problem solving from a space of just asking questions. Cause obviously I didn't know the protocols for disaster management. I had no expertise in this. I ran into a bunch of amazing people and found some fantastic mentors who helped me. But the, the one step that I, that I really find valuable and I still use to this day, no matter whether it's corporate or society is questions helping people solve their own problems or helping people access the knowledge that they have intrinsically within themselves. And then as an outside person, you know, as a consultant, because you're not emotionally invested to any of the, the history or the hurdles, the, uh, the social constructs that usually are what uh, block people in moving forward, you're not emotionally connected to that. So you actually have a bird's eye view, a much more strategic um, way of approaching this problem solving and then advising them in this manner. Um, and so that was sort of my sort of big like aha moment of like, oh, I could just ask questions and then help people figure out the next steps. Um, so I can uh, take this exact like formula. And so in my corporate years working with H&M Japan or Adidas Japan, you know, I'm the newbie. This was at the time, this was like eight years ago when having someone designated as a CSR manager was still quite new. And a lot of my peers, you know, head of marketing, head of HR, just had no idea what, what I was supposed to do, what value I was bringing to the environment. 
So I had to use basically a similar approach where I would sit down and ask them a bunch of questions about how do you think consumers are looking at your, our marketing messages? Do you think they like organic cotton over, over the other one? Do you think they're ready for, a, you know, the price conversation? And by doing this, again, it's allowing them to access the knowledge that they intrinsic, intrinsically have or allowing them as a, um, a Ruth put, you know, the scales to fall from their eyes but helping them figure that out for themselves as opposed to just coming in and say, hey, here's the new strategy, guys. Um, so that was something that I found in community building to be absolutely uh, effective. Um, it was also a great way, especially in Japan, as, as Trista and Ruth, you've mentioned how it's like, they, you know, it has to be done as a group and everybody wants to know that everybody else has their buy-in there. So this way of kind of coming in, not saying I'm the boss, not saying I know better than you, but saying, please help me figure out this problem. And then I always found being a foreigner and then also, yes, being a woman, um, you, I can get that pat on the head of going like, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for presenting in our, in our meeting today. Uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, that often happened. And so I had to find who were the key ambassadors, who were these, these leaders in corporate or these leaders in society that actually got it and get those one or two people to lead for me. So the Japanese businessmen who were, let's say, the store managers at H&M, they, they understood the message of sustainability and of you know, cutting costs and of being more environmentally friendly. They did not see how they were supposed to implement it in their stores. And it was too easy for them to look at me and say, yeah, but you know, you're, you're Angela, you're a foreigner, you've got passion, you've got all these, you know, these traits that, that I don't have and you're okay with making mistakes. Um, and so I had to actually bring in a, you know, like a flag flyer, a, a person who was saying what I was saying, but looked like them. So a Japanese businessman from within their business community who was saying basically what I was saying, but it was just easier for them to say, ah, well, if you can do it, what's my excuse? And, and I talk about this in my book where sometimes you have to be really open to like not getting caught up in, is it my ego? Am I being the one that is the face of this message or is in this situation, is it better to give the, the credit, if you will, to someone else because the greater goal is going to be so much more impactful. And then, you know, I'm kind of the one that's like, okay, that's done. Great. Now we're all here and aligned. Here's the next step. Um, are there any questions around like more specific? So many great things to unpack there, Angela. Anybody want to dive in? Can I Go jump ahead. in there? I was just really thinking, um, so the, the work I do is around that what we call the people side of um, sustainability transformation, right? So moving mindsets and behaviors to align with what the company wants to do. And I think, Angela, what you were talking about there, you've really touched on the core elements of what needs to happen there so finding that intrinsic motivation so rather than coming in whether you're an internal sort of stakeholder or whether you're an external consultant coming in rather than saying here's how you should do it and da 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 which tends people push back right if you come and push on people the the natural reaction is to push back so i think helping them um through asking questions to to identify the intrinsic motivation that's there and find their own way forward um, is so much more powerful and really, really important. And also, um, like you said, identifying the change champions, the people who get it, and then they can act as catalysts throughout uh, you know, to really accelerate and move things forward. Um, and I love the fact you're also talking about taking ego out of it, because it's not like, you know, we, we come in there and go, right, we're going to save you. And we've got all the answers. You've got to leave that at the door and say, right, OK, well, you know, I, I know what you need to do, but I'm not going to necessarily be the right person to deliver that message. So identifying then, you know, whether that's you yourself within your um, sort of internal network in a company or coming in as an outsider and helping them to identify who is your stakeholder network here and, and who's going to be the one who can help you get that message across and get it heard, um, I think is really, really, um, you know, vital to making this happen. So it's really great to hear sort of practical, real stories of how that's played out in your experience. 
I think in in addition to that, finding your champions, right? Oh, we have a little visitor. Hello, extra panelists. Hello, gorgeous. <laughs> Um, finding your champions, finding people that are support you, and hopefully not always having to give up credit. Um, we know this in Japan and around the world, right, is that you'll say something in a meeting and then a male colleague will say something and everybody be like, oh, that's a great idea. And you're like, <laughs> I just said that. Yeah, but that's not, not just in Japan. That happens all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but finding those people in your group or in your business that can support you as well as be a spokesperson for you and give you some credit when it counts. Um, hopefully that, that can also yeah. be possible. Yeah, right? absolutely. I also find that um, you want to be strategic too about when you take your ego out of it and when you say, this is my thing. Because there, you know, there's problems. There's so many big and small issues that you can attack. And if someone is in a meeting that you're just like, oh, forget it. Because at the end of the day, everyone will know how and why this project succeeded or didn't because your name's on the PowerPoint or, you know, your, your face is there on every single report. You're the one taking the minutes. And, and so these things to remember where true, um, like, uh, credit is at and what is superfluous credit that can come and go. Um, so that was, that was an interesting point I found. And also, um, when you're in the beginning of community building, when you really need to bring the stakeholders together, especially in Japan, um, you know, making sure that like everybody has a certain level of face so mm -hmm. that they can really come together as a team. And then as it evolves and moves forward, you, you have your clear leaders and, and your different people who are providing different levels of value, whether that's government entities or like I said, the local grandmother who is doing huge grunt work for this project to bring the community um, together. Um, and that's something that you can also help mitigate through being an outside person and knowing when and how to help delegate that. So also as a community builder, you yourself are that ambassador that is helping those other people find the very sort of aspects that you just shared, Joy, which I thought was really kind of interesting to put that on yourself. Then yeah. Uh, Ruth, you got something to add? Yeah. I, I mean, what Angela just said uh, very much resonates with me as well. Um, when I was doing the real estate venture uh, from 2000 to 2012, um, I was sort of in charge of all the sales at Space Design. But um, like you, um, if the client that I was going to visit was a Japanese company, I would always take my Japanese male bucho with me. Or if it was a um, you know, a gaishke company, a foreign company, and the person on the other end was a bilingual Japanese woman, I would take a bilingual Japanese woman on my team with it there. And I, I very clearly remembered when I started to decide to be happy about the client connecting with somebody other than myself. Mm. So it, I, I would just look and say, oh, my gosh, they connected so well with Suzuki this time or they connected so well with Mayuzumi this time. Go, girl, you know, like that and sort of empower them to grow. And then it's kind of like you're able to disperse the ownership better of the whole thing and you have more people interacting and then you can work behind the scenes to keep things. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the question I had to you was, um, there are moments where you do have to be strict, right? And you have to give difficult feedback uh, about like, you have to speak in real terms about this is not going well. And at least in my case, I kept that circle very small. So it would only be a very small circle of people that I would say anything negative to or say anything, you know, that oh, this, this is really a red flag. We really have to deal with this now. And we would keep that, really close to our chest and to most of the people it was just like oh ruthie's such a nice person and we love working with her and our team but then to a very small group it's like whoa they're really you know picky about this uh, how did you handle like the difficult side of it like you know what i mean i did exactly what you just described actually yeah uh, we i had a very small circle of people that i confided in honestly about everything but it wasn't be necessarily there were two reasons right one is because because of the culture, it is really not worth um, sharing all the fracks, cracks and fissures 
with everybody, especially if they do not have the, like the mental capacity to understand that problems are a nature of moving forward. And instead they look at these problems as like, oh, these are roadblocks we can't overcome. So that was the first reason for to, to keep a really inner circle. The second, like, I guess, strategy of approaching this was really an, uh, educating that inner circle. And this was an inner circle of both like local Japanese politician, Japanese grandmothers, uh, young employees who were part of the program and educating them to this idea that there will be these problems. You are emotionally connected them to various different ways because of local politics, local history, Um, we are an outside organization. And so we cannot take sides with you. So you will hear, like, it's almost like prepping them saying, you will hear X, Y, and Z, and it will seem like a really difficult thing. And if you were just doing this on your own, it might be an end. But because we're taking this stance of inclusion, and because we're bringing in sort of an outside approach, we will be able to do this, right? So kind of stepping up into that almost like that cheerleader mode where you're like, come on, we can do this team. And I'm really relying on getting them to, to, to understand that, not expecting them to understand that right away. So having like a really long, like almost three, four months for them to sort of have those meetings where they're going, and then going, okay, well, we'll pick this up, you know, next week, folks. That lead time of allowing them to go through that process Uh, because they're so used to that right and this is not like a a negative or positive observation it just is what i was working with Um, that was really key for me was giving them that time and then you know three months later they had that idea and i'd be like yeah i'm pretty sure it's like (laughs) planting (laughs) seeds almost right yeah 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 Yeah. it's almost like using that nemawashi sort of uh, approach that is is very japanese um i want i want ruth to talk more about nemawashi in a minute (laughs) Um, it's so Absolutely. important, right, for getting that common group think. Uh, now, Trista, Noriko, and Tova, you both have been collaborators from the beginning with a lot of the big projects that you've done. Angela and Ruth are very solopreneur, kind of the, the headpiece of the project. Uh, is there any differences that you would add, Noriko and Trista, from your, your work? Because you often start with, with other people for these projects, right? Um, yeah, it, it depends. There's usually what ends up happening because we're, you know, it's myself, pr- pretty much my co-founder, is that we often feel we need to bring other people in. You know, I think particularly sustainability issues are so complex. You know, as Tova mentioned, you know, there's the people side of things. Um, we run into human rights issues. We run into, for example, decarbonization. You need people who understand how to decarbonize a company, you know, how to kind of, you know, source good, good kind of viable ways of offsetting carbon. And that's a whole nother kind of world. Um, so oftentimes, you know, they say, well, you know, we want to kind of move to a more sustainable type model, but we don't know how to do it. We often end up saying, okay, we, we can't do all these things ourselves. And I think you have to be very honest about what you can and what you can't do. You know, of course we could all do things more than we probably think we can, we could do if we had time if we had time to learn how to do it properly. But I think we're very, we try to be very, and I specifically try to be very honest about where my limitations are. And I try to create a great network of people that I can tap into as I need it, as I need um, on different things, you know, and I have no issues. I'm definitely a networker type of person. And I should say that, you know, my kind of actual nature is not being a network at all. I'm actually quite an introverted person. You know, I, I don't get my energy from being around other people. I get my energy from being at home and being by myself. <laughs> but I learned throughout my life, especially living in all these different places, that the way you get things done is by creating connections with people and also helping people sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I get clients or things that aren't really, I'm not a good fit for or what have you, and I pass them along, you know? Um, I think that's really important too. <laughs> I think to to not to add or anything, but for me it's um similar and a bit different in the sense that I have to admit I think I have confidence issues. <laughs> and like if I think about Vagino and I think about Ecolocal, they were similar in, in the reasons why it wasn't like I just stood up and I'm gonna do this. Um Vagino, I was, you know, I had a I had an offer from Amazon that I really wanted to 
like work hard on. Um, at the same time, I had this passion for letting people know that veganism is not alien and it's quite easy to do in Japan, actually, already in 2018. And I was just going to have this small Instagram account and, you know, that was it. Or maybe a blog if I could figure out how to do that. I'm not a very techie person. And then my friend um, who was doing sort of the tech work for Virgino encouraged me and said, you know, that's that's motai nai, like you should do more. So if you look at Vagino, it's like, it doesn't look like a personal blog. It's more like, hey, we're a group and we're doing this. And similarly with Echo Local, it was Ellen's idea. And then she was encouraging me to join her. And I was sort of like, I was actually going into my mat leave for this one. And I'm like, um, I've never had a kid. I don't like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my job at Amazon. I think I'm trying to go back after Matt leave. Like, I'm, you know, I was very uncertain about what my life was going to be like. And so I told her, look, I'll stick with you until the end of my Matt leave, which is, you know, um, like six months from when she, she asked me. Um, but past that, who knows? Uh, I ended up quitting Amazon. But I think both were similar in the sense that I was uncertain of what I could do with the project and, and sort of uncertain that I could actually do it um so uh you know i'm kind of grateful for having great people around me who push my backs in both both cases sorry for the noise no no that's fine i i think angela and ruth it'd be interesting to hear from you guys because you are often uh the figureheads uh i i'd be interested to know if sometimes you're you go to meetings and people just want you to do everything they don't want you to share it with your team. Like, is it hard to pass on projects at all? Ruth, do you want to go first? Oh, you can go ahead. Uh, well, I was a very reluctant figurehead. The organization was started with me and like five members of my family. And it was just sort of, it organically evolved that somebody needed to step up there. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, and then my sister went and made this uh, campaign called Forever Support. And I remember getting the t-shirts I was supposed to put on going like, oh my God, but Paula, this is my face here. <laughs> um, but so it was more like there was a situation and I had a choice, obviously. And so I chose to do so, but I was always jumping back and forth between behind the scenes and then, okay, if nobody else can do it, fine, I'll step up. So I was kind of like this reluctant extrovert. Um, and then just just learned how to play along with that. And in Japan, they, you know, sometimes they wouldn't call us the organization saying they it would be Anjiratachi because they really needed this face. So it was a burden and a responsibility. And then to flip that around, I didn't actually have a problem with people like making sure that it was me the only one doing it. I had a problem with me being the only one that could show up. Mm. You know, and then the other the other challenge was trying to to really empower volunteers who came like five, six years after who didn't have my experience, maybe didn't have the knowledge, but but were great public speakers or were fantastic with, you know, putting together really slick PowerPoints to explain in numbers and figures what we were doing, like really being able to hand over that baton. Um, that was challenging for me in terms of, and also then just learning how to delegate. That was a, something that took me quite a while to do. If I have to like, to connect with Noriko there, my insecurities were, I should be doing everything. There was this pressure that because I started it, I should be doing it. And I had to really, it took me a couple of years to learn how to rely on people and build a more uh, flat leadership team there. Ruth, you want to come in? Hmm. I've never really had a problem with um, giving, like, with customers. So there are certain customers that we have, clients that we have, where I do have to do everything just because it's my forte. Like, that's what I can do. Um, but most of them are very smoothly passed to someone else. And I, I think that that comes from me always being sort of a um, marketing salesperson kind of person so no matter when you sales you're always passing the baton to somebody else at, uh, at a certain point like you can't do it all the way to the end so I see my role as CEO as making sure that there's enough money coming into the company so that we can pay everybody and we can be sustainable as a company so Usually I'm the one who thinks of the idea. Uh, and then when I'm closing the deal, I will include other people. And what I've noticed a lot is when the counterpart is a Japanese company and they see a Japanese name and the CC, 
in the email, they're more like, phew, it's not just Ruth, you know, we're not yeah. sure she can read the contract. You know, I have the top 10, you know, real estate license in Japan. I can read the contract. But like Angela was saying, it's a whole thing of, you know, from the 1980s when you came to Japan, if you said, ano kiroi hana kudasai, you know, about at the flower shop, the person would look you straight in the face and say, no English, you know, even though you're trying to speak Japanese. So I feel like there's a, there's kind there's still, even though Japan is trying to globalize, there's still a block, just how you look. So um, I find that a lot of times when there's somebody else is joining, that the Japanese side feels very relieved by that. And then I take a back seat and I'm the strategist now and the tactician behind the scenes. So there's some that I do, I take the main role, which if it matches what I do best. And then there's others where it's maybe operation or like executing a project or something where a project manager, but uh, that's a good point. We will always make sure at the beginning that the Saishu Sekininsha, so the one that takes full responsibility is me. My name is on the company. They do not have to worry. I will always be the one who takes final responsibility. And then you have the project manager who's the actual ex executor of the project. And that will be this person. And then we have this person and this person and this person on the team. And these are the roles. So before we even start a project, we'll always specify exactly what the, the team for this project is. And I'm usually involved there as if anything goes wrong, I'm always going to be there to always step in. And maybe Angela, you did that too. Like Angela touched. Yeah. Like I was just going to say that comes down to just like, it's just that clear communication, setting yeah. their expectations beforehand really helps mitigate any potential problems or miscommunications that we'll have that could come out. And maybe this goes really nicely into Niman Wawashi. Ruth, you want to talk about that and, and talk about your your wheelhouse of what you see as gender equity in the group of a corporate world. Okay, um, so let's start with Nemawashi because it's a nice concept for working in Japan, right? Yeah, so Nemawashi kind of fits in with um, what everyone is saying of the group think, you know, and the consensus building that I feel like you know, it's really, really unique to Japan and it's very, very entrenched in the Japanese system. So it's learning how to work as a group, no matter what you're doing. So keeping everybody on the same page and making sure that the important stakeholders know what's going on, okay? So nemawashi basically means if you had a really stiff root that was stuck, you have to put water around the soil so that you can slowly work out the root. And my mentor um, in Japan who built the company called Recruit, he, he told me very plainly, he said, Ruth, don't you know that Japan is a no society? You're always going to get no, no matter what you want to do. And this guy's built recruit company limited. He was also involved in a huge scandal in Japan. But uh, <laughs> so he would say, basically, in order to succeed in anything in Japan, you know, you have to know how to dig under the no, go around the no, uh, smash through the no, climb over the no. There's always going to be a no. And I was like, well, if this guy, if a man who's Japanese, who built a huge company in his own generation, you know, not inheriting it from his parents or something, I think I want to stick with him and learn how to do this. And so I was lucky enough to work with him for 12 years directly watching him start a new business in Japan. And I learned a lot. So um, more than talking about, uh, you know, Nemashi is really important, but I would like to share a few key concepts about trying to get something done in Japan and things that you definitely want to keep in the back of your mind. And I wonder if any of the other ladies in the group have um, noticed this, but um, I think there's a really important point of never exposing anyone in the, the Japanese sphere to something that they didn't know. So you would never, uh, I, I hesitate using the word public because basically if you're together um, having a beer at an izakaya 
and you're talking about important things and there's some negative things you say and you maybe call somebody, that person out on something, that's totally fine. But let's say anything larger than that. So three or more people. Uh, when you're in a situation with three or more people, whether you're speaking English, whether you're speaking Japanese, um, in, in a Japanese setting, right? You would, you would never want to expose someone for not knowing something in that situation. That is probably one of the worst things. And I'm saying this from my personal uh, mistakes that I've made. Um, it's probably one of the worst things. And it's probably one of the reasons uh, you might get a no. So you want to go around and over and under and smash through the no. You also want to not create a no, right? So Exposing someone can be many things, like if you're working on sustainability or if you're talking about um, zero waste or anything like that, plant-based diet, and you're in a sort of a group setting of three or more people, you want to take the stance of, you know, I don't really know either, but this is what I've learned out of my personal experience, or I don't really know too much about, you know, what's going on in Japan, but I have heard this data and um, yeah, I noticed this was really good the other day and I'm trying to do this. So it's sort of like in a kind of a public situation, you would never expose anyone else lack of knowledge about whatever you're talking about. So I, I don't know how that would, unfortunately, I've only done work in Japan. So I don't know how this would um, translate into another culture, but at least in Japan, that's definitely something I've learned, like not to expose a lack of knowledge among any of your colleagues in front of other people. So that involves not having anybody lose face or anything like that. Um, the other one point that I was going to say, oh, two points, is um, I think that all of us, when we're interacting with uh, any kind of Japanese organization or region or anything, um, you can assume that there's much deeper thinking going on than it appears. So um, Japanese people uh, in general, I would say, um, don't show too much emotion in a meeting. So if everything's very proper, if you can imagine, you know, the proper way of being in a meeting, sitting straight, you know, not like what I do, which is like, uh -huh, like that, you know, the whole meeting. <laughs> but, you know, people kind of listening, not so much smiling, not so much, you know, not so much reaction, but I think that everybody watching this podcast or anybody who's interested in this subject can, you know, 100% for sure assume that people in your realm are thinking much deeper than you, than it appears to be. So um, you can assume that after this meeting, somebody's going to go look up your website and read through it really carefully. Or after this meeting, somebody's going to order the book you recommended and they're actually really going to read it. And, you know, people are taking it much more seriously than it might appear. So that's a, a really important assumption when you're trying to do something in Japan. And then finally, um, in order to get anything done, I think um, trying to understand the structure of the counterpart you're working with is like beyond important. So what kind of structure is that organization or what kind of structure is that company? So oftentimes when you're signing an NDA or when you're doing any kind of contract or if you're if you need to submit an estimate or if they want to sub you to submit a proposal or something, I will always ask, is there any kind of format that you use on your side? And uh, oftentimes there is, or they'll give you an example of something that they've presented in the past. And so if you can receive that first, you'll already know the kind of format that they're used to, as opposed to you just sort of recreating the wheel kind of thing. So when you get to the final point where you really have to take a stand and say, you know, this is what we need to charge and this is our estimate, if until that point you've been extremely flexible doing it sort of their way and trying to figure out who's the who has the power, who doesn't, you know, looking at your meishi to see what kind of, um, you know, titles everybody has, uh, maybe going in for a few uh, in-person meetings, uh, doing Zoom meetings, asking questions, you know, you've done all this, you're looking at who's on CC, you're sort of figuring out the structure of the counterpart. 
And then when you actually have to turn something in, asking for examples, uh, in my experience, has always worked. Because you look at that example and you're like, uh huh. They pay two months later. Hmm, good. I'm glad I knew that. You know, like there's all these little things that can come up. And um, knowing the structure of your counterpart, um, taking a role of, you know, I don't know either, but um, this is what I'm thinking. I don't really know 100% and I can't be sure, but this is some data I saw recently. Maybe we should think about this or this might be a kadai that we have. We have, not you guys have, right? And then... Um, the final one was not to expose anyone's lack of knowledge in a, like a public setting. Uh, you can do your nemashi at the, when you're drinking the beer at the izakaya with the guy and you can say, I'm really worried about what that comment the other day that that gentleman said, cause it sounded like they didn't really, they weren't on the same page as us. So maybe we should, you know, let them know. And then that guy after the meeting, we'll go and talk to them. And yeah, that's basically, it's kind of, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining very well, but uh, that's basically been my experience. I wonder if it helps anyone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of great things to unpack there. I'd be interesting, Trista or Noriko, because what Ruth is saying about having that humble approach of coming to a meeting and be like, I'm not really sure, doesn't really work when you're trying to talk about ESGs or SDGs or things that really are kind of new in Japan, right? Uh, yeah. Did you want to talk about that? I mean, I, I think that it's, it's, it, the role that you come in is very different in the sense that we often come in as a little bit like the sensei and I'm not entirely comfortable with that role to be perfectly honest. Um, Cause I, I come from a background of, you know, kind of discussion and two way, but you know, the thing is that a lot of Japanese companies just don't know. And I actually, that was a shock to me because, you know, people say, well, what's going on in Europe, for example, around, uh, circular economy or what's going on in the United States around startup innovation and climate tech. And, and people are just sponges for this information, which is really fascinating because yeah. I, I assumed when I started all this, well, you know, we're going to have to work with people and they'll know already because they have hundreds of thousands of people in these countries and surely they must have done this research themselves. No, but I, I do have to, we, we do ask a lot of questions like, well, what do you think? And yeah, you know, what's right. going on in your company? And, you know, what have you seen? And you're doing this initiative. And that seems really interesting. Tell us more about that. And that's we, how we try to interject that in. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I, I think, yeah, in sustainability, you always have to strike a careful balance. And yeah. I would, I would say just one quick thing I'll say about the kind of feedback in the moment, facial expressions. I think from a foreigner perspective, COVID in, in many ways helped because people have masks on. So all of a sudden, we don't have the normal ways that we're used to getting feedback from people, right? right? And so it's really, so we often say things like, okay, you know, we'll check in next week and see how you feel. If you have any feedback, please let us know. I don't assume anything about people's reaction anymore because I have this thing where I right. can't really see people's reaction anymore. It's really forced me to see people a little differently. And to, like you said, dig a little below the surface and also have patience. I think right. Westerners, we are very impatient people. Like we get, we like answers and feedback immediately, right? And patience in Japan is an incredibly important virtue. So that's all I would say. Well, what you were saying about in the sensei role, we also get that too. So in the sensei role, I wouldn't say, I don't really know much about ESG, but what we do is exactly what you would do, which is, here are examples of other countries in the world. Like here's some objective information for your reference. And then when you're talking about their company is when you would say, well, I mean, I noticed this on your website, you know, what do you think about this? You know, in a very positive way, it, the, the worst thing to do is to say, I noticed this on your website, this is bad, you need to change this now because then that's Absolutely, exposing, yeah. someone, exposing yeah. someone to criticism, right? So, um, yeah, it's a it's a fine balance, but as the sensei, it's giving the objective information and then saying, and so what do you all think about it? You know, and starting discussion is definitely, I think, a, a successful way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Angela or Noriko? Noriko, you've actually, it's really interesting. I'd love to hear more about how you talk with businesses about doing like the Echo Shop Along and trying to get them to accept the idea of trying it a new way. I think it, it kind of grows from some of the ideas Ruth was talking about. 
Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, no, no, Nicole, is the mic on? Uh, okay, go ahead. Does everyone hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We've tried several approaches and it's interesting journey. It's been an interesting journey because we started with just walk right in, me as the co-founder and then Karina, who is our events manager. Okay, may she's out. You know, we're a legit Kabushki Geisha. And that was like mistake number one because many of these well, small businesses that um, we deal with on our maps and on our shop alongs, the moment they see a Meishi, they're like, bye. Hmm. You're not a customer, bye. And if you think about it, like a lot of these places are cash only. So they've rejected PayPal, uh, PayPay, sorry, the salesmen of PayPay. They've rejected the salesmen of Recruit. They've rejected the salesmen of Suica, everyone. And then you come in as with any old Meishi. It doesn't really matter if they know the company name or not. They just don't like salesmen. So we made that first mistake and we're like, okay, no Meishi maybe. <laughs> and then now we have this kind of hybrid approach of um, self-intro, kind of approach it and introduce ourselves as a project, which we think of ourselves as one. Um, but also when we feel that, you know, the shop would benefit from knowing that we're actually not like this weird group of people or, or whatever, then we do also say that we're a company. So we're kind of having this hybrid approach of, because sometimes that actually really works in Japan when you say that you're a Kabushiki Gaisha, even if they know nothing of you, they're like, oh, wow, you're a Kabushiki Gaisha. Okay. Um, so we try to use that hybrid approach based on, you know, a conversation and what we find about that shop owner. Um, so that's been what we've learned through our mistakes. And then I think the other thing is, um, very interestingly, and it's been a struggle for us, is that um, many of these shop owners and business owners don't actually want to be on the internet or they don't mm -hmm. care. They yeah. don't care about sustainability. They don't care about marketing. They don't care about more people coming in, riding yeah. trains just to do zero waste shopping. They're like, no, 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 don't want it. Nothing new, nothing unfamiliar. Leave me out of it. Like, I like my store as it is. I like my customers. I'm happy. Like, the amount that I get from my customers is enough to, you know, keep a roof over my head. If I have a happy family, a happy income, it's fine. Like I'm, I have just enough. And there's that mentality of like not wanting to grow. It's not, I don't think it's a negative thing. It's just like being happy with just enough, which we've witnessed in a lot of these businesses, maybe because they're getting old and they just don't have the capacity to, you know, grow or have more sales, or maybe just really they're happy with what they have. They're like, just leave us out of it. So again, that's like another way that we've learned, okay, let's not make it from this angle from our point of view, which is, hey, by bringing in more customers, we help you, right? We're helping you because you're struggling with, like we've seen a lot of tofu stores go out of business precisely because of COVID and because people are now shopping more online on Amazon or um, which, you know, great to have these infrastructures, but then smaller businesses are suffering even just with, um, you know, more supermarkets going up. And so for us, we're like, hey, we're helping the local businesses get, new customers or more traffic or more sales. And they're just like, no, no, we don't want new customers. <laughs> Interestingly, though, through the, you know, uh, conversations, and I think you're all familiar with um, Tatemai and Honne, which is Tatemai is like the, 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 what you see or what you hear. And Japanese people often think differently, which is the Honne. Um, what we have realized the Honne is, is of course they want more sales. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not necessarily in the form of, you know, new marketing, online marketing, whatever. But yes, sales, they're always, every store is always happy to have more sales. And so now, like, we sort of approach them with, like I said, an introduction of projects slash Kabushiki Gashi, depending on their um, response. And then the way that we introduce our project and, and invite them to be, um, you know, one of the five or seven stores that day for the Echo Shop Along. It's just kind of to position it as, look, like we have these bunch of people who are interested in living this way and we identify that you provide it anyway. Um, and is it OK that, you know, the, we're coming on this particular day, it's going to be a small crowd, not too big. Would that be OK? Like that's not going to give you any mewaku. It's not going to get in your way or disrupt your business. So we kind of come at it from a would you mind if we come like, you know. Yeah. It, it, it will only be here for a bit. And they're like, yeah, sure, you're bringing us more sales. Like, we've heard this several times. And we're like, okay, so everyone does want more sales. And yeah. that's kind of how, you know, through all these little mistakes and detours, we've learned that, okay, we're right that they would benefit more sales. We were just very wrong in how we approach them in many ways. And while I look Japanese, like, bank, I worked in Citibank and then Amazon. Yeah. Um, so actually, my career has not, uh, I haven't spent a lot of my time in my career talking to a lot of um, very 
sort of traditional uh, Japanese people or teams. And so I'm still learning, <laughs> which is very interesting as well. So it's kind of like, under, again, understanding the structure on the other side, like how is this structure function, right? So maybe it's one store that you're thinking of, but they might want to do it along with the whole Shoten guy. Right. Like if you got the Shoten guy people to agree with it, they feel more comfortable to agree. And, you know, they don't want to do something on their own. It's just really important to understand the structure on the other side. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And if I can just come in as well, I think this goes back to something you said earlier, Ruth, about um, sort of wanting to uh, sort of build confidence and then bravery um, and then change. Right. It, it's it's incremental. It's not coming in here going, ta da, we can do this for you. And it's going to be really amazing because that's it's overwhelming, I think, particularly for for people who've been doing the same thing the same way for a long time. If you suddenly come in there with this huge sort of big, crazy idea, it's just too much to take on. And immediately the walls go up. Right. But if you can come in, I love that approach, Noriko, sort of like tapping into um, you know, a project approach, maybe something they're doing already. And it's just like, you know, can we just try this? And it, it's really not threatening at all. It's not too disruptive. And they can just like, okay, it, it's a safe, easy way to start. And then you've got something to build on. You're establishing the relationship, which particularly here in Japan, right, is so, so important. Um, and we do the same inside. I know Trista and I do this a lot in our work with corporations, right? It, it's you start with the small wins. If you come in and say, right, we've got this big transformation plan for you, usually they just go, ah, uh, no. And that's the end of the conversation. But if you could start with, okay, well, there's this little project we could do here and you kind of get things started and people get excited about that. And then suddenly you're off and rolling and it's a totally different conversation. And you, you never really know what people don't know. Right. So I think Trista's approach of well here's what other countries are doing you know what are you all thinking about because when on one of these board meetings I said something about you know and DNI DNI is totemo daiji desu yo ne I said something like that the guy the vice president who is in charge of their entire DNI and everything with sustainability it's all of a sudden it started he came over to me and he's like Lucy anone DNI te nan de shake what is DNI again Whoa. You know what I was talking about? He just had never heard D and I said that way. Yeah. So he, you know, creating a situation where people feel comfortable asking questions because you really do not know how much people are going to know. Yeah. Or not know. And I, I love uh, going back to that point, Ruth, about it, uh, building trust, right? And I, I think, Angela, you, you over 10 years of doing the Place to Grow organization or Noriko coming from a background of Amazon or Angela with Adidas and H&M, having these in your back pocket that people can refer to in terms of trust is also an important component, right? Or yeah. your history. I found Ruth, you're you're talking about the structure again, just to be like, yes, yes, and yes, because it's actually one of the easiest ways you it's like you're making it easy for them to say yes. Because in Japan, you know, it's like, which box do I check? And the easiest way to understand this is think of going to the city office. You can't go there to the sale, the clerk and say, Oh, this is my problem, help me with this. They don't know how to process you. So then they just go, no. But if you, if you know how they're supposed to say yes, which box, you know, it's like a maze, right? Which maze is this person supposed to go through? Then they just go, ah, it really doesn't matter what it is. It's, is this going through the format that I know how to understand in order to make a decision? And so really, and I think this is not just Japanese. I think this is really universal because when we talk about like marketing and stuff, it's like start with the problem in your client's head. What are they going to say yes and no to? What are they thinking about? And then, you know, building the, the small questionnaire or the small survey that allows them to go, oh, I can trust this person uh, really just helps a lot of pain and suffering. But that was definitely, you know, a lot of blood, sweat and tears going into understanding that that process and understanding how valuable it can be for communications in general. Now let's transition a little bit to when you don't have time to build trust. Trista, you wanted to talk about startups 
and female entrepreneurs, yeah. which is a, another side of the coin, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, this topic at the moment is incredibly pertinent in Japan for a lot of reasons. Um, there's been a lot of analysis that's been done about, you know, why Japan has not um, moved more quickly in terms of entrepreneurship versus some other other markets. Um, and I think what, what what people are realizing is that, you know, to kind of move into the next phase of, of Japan's, you know, story, right, in its history, uh, entrepreneurship is going to play a fundamental part. Um, what we're seeing is we definitely are seeing corporations that are kind of um, fraying a little bit um, in terms of their models from the past. And now we need kind of new models for the future. And so, you know, throughout Japanese society, people are looking at, okay, how can we encourage people to kind of start their own ventures, you know? Um, all of our big, huge organizations in Japan used to be startups at one point in time, and it's important to remember that. Um, as we know, women um, are entrepreneurs, and women's entrepreneurship is, is, is a real challenge, not just in Japan, but around the world. Women tend to get funded um, much less frequently um, than men do, and even founder teams that have one woman on them with other men get funded much less uh, frequently than, uh, than all male teams do. do. But I think at the moment, um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, um, to solve some big challenges and problems. And one of the things that I do hope is that I hope that many women will be able to have kind of paths like I did, and maybe Noriko did, and you know, other women on the call as well, where we can kind of maybe come back and forth a little bit between the corporate world and also the entrepreneurial world because those experiences are, are very important for each other for, for, for many different different reasons. Um, but you know, one issue is obviously funding, which Joy, you mentioned a little bit earlier. And what are some of the things that that women can do to kind of better position themselves, I think, um, to do that? I, I think the first thing that I've seen women entrepreneurs do which is very successful is basically just just show up, you know. <laughs> basically knock on every door, ask a lot of questions, ask, because I think the worst thing, you know, we talked a lot about saying no, but I think many people in entrepreneurship, the thing that they struggle with the most, and I know I struggle with is, is the no, but being a great entrepreneur is being willing to get out there and accept the no over and over and over and over again until somebody says yes. Uh, and I think that's really hard, right? And I think particularly as women, I think that's extremely hard for us to do. But I think that's that's really the first step. I think the next step is really, as I as I was talking about before, about networking. That makes a huge difference in terms of fundraising. The amount of and actually networking before you even need the money. This is something that um, that you know just startups that I've seen kind of in their development over time, and even all male run startups. What they do really well is they make those networks really early, and so when they actually need the funding and they need the support, they get it. Um, so I think that's another thing. And then I think the third thing I would say is, um, you know, businesses come in all shapes and sizes, right? So there's some companies or some businesses that will never raise, for example, venture capital, right? They're not venture capital line businesses. It doesn't really make sense. Um, they may need to kind of get debt financing or go to the bank or get a loan or rely on friends and family to kind of help them get their business off the ground. But I would like to see women um, create more scalable businesses, right? And this means businesses that are not just fit for purpose in Japan and can really scale well in Japan, but can, spell, can scale internationally. This is really important. And one reason it's really important is that as women, we often, we, we often complain a little bit after the fact. So, you know, the tech ecosystem kind of went in a way, it, it went in a very male oriented way. Um, a lot of that was because we also didn't really participate as much in the beginning, you know, and there's a lot of re structural reasons for that and everything. Um, but it's really important that we we rightfully claim our place at the table, if you will. So women have great ideas, you know, be really ambitious, come up with, like I talked to you before about crazy ideas, things that really can kind of you know, shake up and change things. Um, I, I would like to see more women, especially younger women, do that, you know, um, because I think to be able to kind of claim our rightful place in this space, we need to create those types of types of ventures. So those are just some kind of first thoughts for me. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to kind of see what others think about this topic because it is, you know, a really challenging one, but such a critically important one, I think, for the future of Japan. And not just Japan, you know, globally, but definitely um, here in Japan. 
Definitely. Anyone else want to comment on what people are talking about? I, I just really want to, I was just like nodding through the whole thing. And one of the things that, you know, you said about showing up and kind of claiming our, our seat or whatever, I really have to nod because you could argue always that it's the environment or the, the social yeah. structure that, you know, discourages us. But I think if you have a bit of courage, then step up, you know, take it um, is what I always feel. And kind of in the showing up phase, um, we recently got some investment from a VC and then we we're sort of like encouraged to start looking for six months ahead as well. And I was talking to one, I guess you could call this person a potential angel investor as well. And he asked about my upcoming mat leave. And I realized like, I didn't really have this stringent plan about when I will stop working and then when I will resume and etc. And I realized for him, that is a risk. And he was kind enough to not use, he used very nice words, considered words, but basically outlined as a risk for an investor. And what I realized then as a learning is that like, we just, we as women are different. We will have these pauses. We will have these things, whether your husband or partner or family member, friends are, you know, going to help you in with existing children and existing, you know, maybe you have elders to take care of, whatever. Um, even if you have that support network, you may still want to choose to spend more time with your children and you know whatnot I think we will have that and then I think the most important thing is to actually acknowledge that we're different like mm -hmm. men are never going to be able to give birth, birth on our behalf at least not in this century or the next run so like we're going to have to have a pause and you have to heal you have to you know and I think acknowledging that and then not making that a murky I'll come back when I feel like it but then just acknowledging that and then saying okay I'll build a plan and of course the plan may move but what I learned from that conversation with the the potential investor is just that which is okay it's fair that people see certain things about a women leader as a risk but then don't make that into something to complain about or then you know, you could, I can blame a lot of things about that comment, but then I realize actually it's a great learning because that's one way I can show up, build a stringent plan and say, next time somebody asks me that question, I'll know exactly what to say. And that's great. Like I'm embracing the fact that I'm going to take a mat leave, but I'm also embracing the fact that we're looking for money and there's a business to run. So I really resonated the fact, you know, with what you said, Trista, about showing up and, and kind of taking, taking what's yours, because I, I do believe that that's important for all of us to do. And, that, and can I say one other thing as well? So for the women who do not want to be entrepreneurs, but we talked about corporate world, who have great careers, who are maybe a little bit older, I absolutely encourage you to invest your money. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you, know? you know, I think this is something men also do seamlessly. They're always investing in something. Their risk tolerance is, is a bit higher than ours. And actually, in the last few years, you know, when I can, I've started investing in startups as well. I feel like that's the least I can do. And also it benefits me if it pays off, you know, it's, it's a great investment for me, but I think that's really important, right? Um, because there are not enough women investors and that's part of the reason we have this problem in the first place. And, and even if you're kind of scared. So for me, for example, I think when new technology comes online, we often get really scared. So I was very scared of the whole crypto world, right? And my husband's like, oh yeah, it's not a big deal. And I'm like, I don't know, it's a bunch of crazy people. So what I did was I found an organization, it's called shefi.org, and they do classes for women about this. And some of the women are highly skeptical. Some of the women are all in, but it doesn't matter, right? We're learning about something new. We have classes once a week and then we have a TA session in the morning. And I think that's really important, right? Even if you don't want anything to do with it, it's important to understand what's going on. And oftentimes as women, we don't do that. Um, so I, I'm trying to do that more myself, even though I'm no longer in the younger generation, but, <laughs> but I'm definitely trying to stay in touch. Absolutely. Uh, getting all the information before you decide whether it's worth you trying to invest your time and energy and money as well, yes. right? Uh, speaking of funding, Ruth, you mentioned uh, to me before about women loans, like for women in business, there's spe special support in Japan? Yeah, I'm not a specialist on this, but um, I've received loans for my company from the Jose Kosha. So I guess it's the Japan, you know what it is, Angela and uh, Noriko, you probably guys know, I don't know. I don't know how to say it in English, but there's the, it's a government organization. It's a not, so it's a government run bank, maybe it's not really a bank. So the very, very low interest loans and they have um, special loans set up for entrepreneurs and special advantage loans set up for women, especially women entrepreneurs. 
and the you know the process is really difficult to understand and you know it takes it's a a lot of steps i guess but thanks to that i've never had to borrow anything from the bank um mine is much more of a, a consulting based company so we don't have a product that we can show so like you said trista i don't think that we're right for like venture capital or anything so um I do want to scale it though, but anyway, um, this Jose Kosha was very, very good for uh, getting a low interest loan and it's government. So um, that's a great thing about uh, have, being an entrepreneur in Japan. If you get a loan from the government, they really do not want to let you fail. They absolutely do not want to. So um, I've had additional uh, loans from them. So yeah, that, that was a really, really good tool for me from the beginning. That's great. And uh, Angela, you did fundraisers, right? Like crowdfunding. Uh, can you talk about that for a minute? Sure. Fundraising is, is same, same, but different, right? It's just a different process of how the funds are sort of reported back on. So I really resonated with Trista's uh, suggestion about how the men are building that network way in advance. Because one thing like in, in nonprofit in fundraising, it's like there's nine touch points before you have an ask. So that means, you know, like you're going, it used to be for me, it'd be like, I'm going to an event, then I'm following up, I'm asking for a coffee, I'm giving them something, maybe I'm sharing some product from the region. And it's like, it's a whole journey and you're building trust and you're building relationships. And then when it's like, oh, it's our annual capital, you know, uh, campaign, would you like to make an X thousand dollar donation for, you know, this, this and this, way more likely to say yes. And then on Ruth's point of like knowing the structure if I'm approaching corporates, it's like, I need to know when in the year are they building their budget? Not three months after they've already built their budget. Otherwise, you know, it's a whole nother year I have to wait. So understanding the processes, the pain points, the easy low hanging fruits from any one of my potential clients was, was always very, very important. And knowing which kind of hat to put on, like, I think Noriko, you mentioned this when you were doing the conversations, is that the hybrid approach, right? It's like, which shop is going to say yes to Kabushiki Gaisha, oh, sugoi, sugoi. And which one is going to say yes to, hey, I'm Noriko and I'm doing this. And they'll be like, oh, my grandmother had a similar story. Or, you know, you're building your, your relation points. And everyone is a little different, but it really does help having an answer for everyone that asks. I really resonated, Noriko, with your trying to explain mat leave. Like off the top, and, and it reminded me of like the day that different situation, but I was like, I really need a 30 second speech for these three different questions that I often get asked. Uh, and that makes me think that Ruth, your, your uh, suggestion for knowing the structure applies to Japanese, but also applies to men because they might be a counterpart and, and on a way they're, they're a client, right? They're either going to get on board and support you or not, whether you're in the corporate office or whether they're an actual client of your startup. And so knowing how am I going to explain a women's perspective to, to this guy's brain could be worthwhile and having an, a, a ready sort of, you know, 30 second spiel that, you know, it's going to tick the boxes for how this guy sees the world could be really, um, really helpful, I think. And there was one more thing, Trista, that you mentioned, which is like that I was like, oh, my God, yes, but I forgot and hopefully it'll come back. So we, we have just a few more minutes. Is there any like burning thing that people want to say? in the last few minutes before we finish up. So many great ideas here. Go ahead, Ruth. Um, knowing the structure point, also knowing the budget is really good. So I never hesitate on saying, like how much are you thinking about in terms of budget? And also knowing how much your counterpart can approve is really important. So if they're like a kacho level, it's usually under 200,000 yen. If they're a bucho level, it goes up to about a million yen. And so knowing their level of how much they can approve is also really important. And it's totally fine to ask. Goyo-san wa donna kanji de shouka is like my favorite thing to write in an email. And, you know, they'll usually come back and people say they really appreciate that uh, from me as a, a non-Japanese that I'm very frank about money matters and it makes it clear for them. So, yeah, don't be afraid to ask about money. So when you say Goyo-san, you're asking for their budget? Yeah. Goyo-san is like, how much were you thinking about? Like, before I even say this is how much we would charge, um, if they come back and say, well, how much would you charge for something like this? I will still say, well, how much were you thinking about? Because you don't want to 
oftentimes you really don't know what what they have control over. And then you can just, you know, you can tweak your idea to fit into that budget. It's not very hard. Better to hear from them because then they can get it approved. And you know, when they send you an actual amount of money, they've already done somewhat of a nemawashi inside their company to even engage with you about that amount. So it's, it's a pretty good sign when somebody comes back with an actual amount. That's great. Yeah. Anybody else? One more minute. Last point. I remembered what Krista said. Okay, go ahead, Angela. Um, so she was talking about how what makes a really great um, entrepreneur is like accepting the no's and the no's and the no's. And then it reminded me about how sometimes, you know, men can be, or other very successful people can be a bit patronizing. And one technique I used to kind of overcome both of these was just to go ahead and say, look, after five suggestions, it's probably going to be something good. And I'm putting my hand up here to say the five stupid ones. So that, you know, there's no, 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 no. And then boom, as a team, we're, we're going to find that, that good idea. But just so you know, there's going to be a lot of, you know, silly stuff. And I felt like that was me kind of being a woman, taking myself, putting myself at the table, but not putting the pressure that I needed to be like right or have this perfect approach right away. And then it's much easier to do as Taylor Swift says, which is to just shake it off, shake yeah. it off, shake off all those notes, shake off all that, you know, um, all that high, high, high that you can get. Being vulnerable yeah. is never a problem. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like when I try a new trail race and I'm horrible at trail running. Somebody has to be last. I'm glad to be that person. You got to be <laughs> cheerful. Everybody else feels better. You know, no bad ideas. Just throw those out there. I love it. Uh, that was a great two hours, you guys. Really fantastic. Any final words, Tova, before we sign off? Um, I think just briefly, I mean, yeah, it's been fantastic listening to everybody. So many insights. I've got like a massive page of of notes and scribbles here. Um, and I think for, for me and, and Joy and Shirley sort of thinking ahead to the event in May, um, uh, just a, a question to maybe anybody who's listening or anybody who watches the recording afterwards, you know, listening to everything that's um, been talked about today, what are the real core things that you would like to see us um, uh, talk about and sort of do workshops around in that event. We've already got, um, you know, a, a schedule kind of mapped out, but it's still flexible at this stage. So one thing that really came up for me listening there was, you know, like Laura, Norica was talking about, what's, what's your pitch? How do you cope with these questions that you know are going to come back? And Angela, you mentioned it as well. Um, just thinking about anticipating those and, and how are you going to respond to them in a, so that they don't throw you off guard? Um, so that's potentially something we could uh, do a little workshop on. And I think um, people here would have amazing contributions to that. So Shirley, anything to add on that? Yes, I mean, I totally agree with you, Toa, on this. I'm also, I've also like taken a lot of notes, like pages and pages, and I'm, I'm going to look back at it. But something that really stood out to me as somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur and who's like really young in this would be like networking early. Like if you mm. know in the next six months you want to like have crowdfunding, for example, or investment, you start now. It's not like you start after six months, but also like actually thinking about scalable businesses. Because when I think about business, I'm like, oh, let me just make a website, which I don't really need anybody's money for. But I mean, you are in a position where people are willing to invest in you if you have, you know, good ideas and just, you know, being in the space where we are talking about, we are talking with so many inspiring women. It just inspires me to like take that step and just go ahead and do it. And if it fails, it fails, you know, it's like rejection is redirection. So yeah, thank oh, you so that. much. <laughs> That is a perfect note to end on. I think we are 51% of the population. We are representing so many great ideas and don't be afraid to fail forward and just keep trying. And hopefully people who are watching this feel inspired to you know, try their own challenges, try their own projects. And uh, hopefully we can inspire people who are watching not only around Japan, but around the world. So thank you all so much for joining today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.